Wednesday, October 9th, 2024. Floridians from Tampa Bay to Fort Myers, myself included, are anxiously awaiting the landfall of Hurricane Milton. While the hurricane would go on to eventually make landfall later in the evening on Siesta Key, becoming the first major hurricane on record to make landfall in Sarasota County, there was another record-breaking event that unfolded earlier in the day that surprised everyone, including some of the Sunshine State's most veteran meteorologists. Within an agonizing 24-hour span, from the late evening of October 8th and through October 9th, an astonishing 46 tornadoes would descend from Milton's turbulent skies and bury themselves into the Florida Peninsula, unleashing chaos and anguish in their wake. This relentless barrage of twisters shattered Florida's historical records, prompting the National Weather Service offices in Tampa Bay and Miami to issue an unprecedented cascade of warnings. Join me as we revisit this historic outbreak and unravel the atmospheric forces that made it not only possible, but so devastatingly unique. I'm CJ, and this is Florida Man Weather. Our story begins rather quietly on October 5th, 2024. That day, a modest tropical depression was forming in the warm, calm waters of the Western Gulf. This tranquility would soon be shattered, however, by a rare and explosive transformation, an alarming process meteorologists call rapid intensification, which, according to the National Hurricane Center, is when the hurricane's maximum sustained winds increase by at least 35 miles per hour within a 24-hour period. It is a frightening process, one that remains notoriously difficult to predict and often results in devastating consequences. Over the next 48 hours, Milton would undergo a remarkable metamorphosis, escalating rapidly into a formidable Category 5 hurricane with terrifying maximum sustained winds reaching nearly 190 miles per hour. At the same time, Milton's central pressure had also plunged dramatically to a staggering 895 millibars, matching the historical intensity of Hurricane Rita in 2005 and securing its ominous place as one of the most powerful hurricanes ever documented in the Atlantic Basin. Unlike typical hurricanes that march confidently westward or northwestward, Milton took an atypical route, eerily tracking eastward across the Gulf of Mexico, heading ominously towards Florida's vulnerable Gulf Coast. Yet, as the storm edged closer to the peninsula, it collided head-on with increasingly hostile atmospheric conditions. Strong vertical wind shear, that's the changing of wind direction with height, began to steadily undermine Milton's structure and strength. And, thankfully, despite its immense power, the storm weakened as it approached Florida, descending from its catastrophic Category 5 peak to a still formidable Category 3 hurricane with sustained winds raging at 120 miles per hour. Nevertheless, as Milton came ashore on October 9th, its ferocity remained potent enough to unleash catastrophic damage across the region. October 8th, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Meteorologists working for the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, release a mesoscale discussion, a special weather update that helps local forecasters prepare and decide if watches or warnings need to be issued to keep people safe for areas offshore of the Florida Keys. As the evening progresses, the National Weather Service in Key West would then continue to monitor the ominous ink black sky as Hurricane Milton's outermost rain bands would rake mercilessly across the Keys. At around 1137, the darkness births a phantom. A ghostly water spout emerges into the water, twisting furiously towards Key West's Truman Annex. As the water spout turned tornado moves ashore, palm trees are shredded effortlessly like delicate paper fans caught in a tempest. Roof shingles soar like deadly projectiles through the sultry night air, and an iron dumpster catapults through the sky, smashing violently through a second story window and sending shards of glass cascading into a startled bedroom. Within mere moments, this brief but savage EF-1 twister carved a 300 yard wound through the island before dissipating mysteriously back into the roiling sea. Then. A few hours later and a couple of hundred miles to the northeast, 
The first confirmed tornado on the mainland struck the outskirts of Florida City, a sleepy community in Miami-Dade County at around 4.30 in the morning. Though brief, the EF-1 twister reached wind speeds of 87 miles per hour, toppling trees and fences. While these two tornadoes were isolated temporally from the remainder of the outbreak, few at the time would understand that these would mark the opening salvo of an unfolding disaster of unprecedented magnitude. As dawn broke, Hurricane Milton, downgraded but still a formidable Category 4, crept ever closer to Siesta Key. High above, punishing vertical wind shear clawed at the storm's core, fraying its eye but imbuing its rain bands with dangerous, rotating energy. Forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center knew what was coming. The atmosphere ahead of Milton's outer bands had become primed for tornadoes. A tornado watch was then issued for the entire Florida peninsula south of Interstate 4. By then, National Weather Service meteorologists were already tracking rotating storms across southern Florida. Then, at 8.45 a.m., one of those storms delivered the day's first tornado. An EF-0 that tracked for nine miles near US-41 in rural Miami-Dade County. Damage was minimal, but radar told a more unsettling story. Intensifying gate-to-gate -gate rotation, the kind that hinted that was just the beginning. Less than an hour later, at 9.42, the same supercell spawned a larger, more photogenic tornado that carved a path across I-75 near the Miccosukee Reservation before churning north into the Big Cypress Seminole lands. FDOT traffic cameras and eyewitnesses captured this striking scene as a visible debris cloud churned across the open Everglades. Mere minutes later, another tornado appeared along the eastern stretches of Alligator Alley. Both twisters thankfully remained over the open sawgrass wetlands sparing lives but signaling that the outbreak was rapidly intensifying. By 10.42 a.m., Hendry County was under siege. An EF-1 tornado with 95 mile per hour winds tore through Clewiston, leaving a 17 mile scar across the landscape. Trees were uprooted, debris swirled high into the air, and startled morning commuters near the Sky Valley neighborhood watched as skies blackened near a Walmart before the storm finally dissipated over the sugarcane fields. Just 45 minutes later, at 11.27, another powerful EF-1 would touch down. Later named the Ortona Tornado, it carved a nearly 30-mile path through Hendry and Glades counties, snapping utility poles along State Road 80 and battering rural communities. Though unseen by human eyes, radar and satellite imagery confirmed its strength and size. Then, at 11.45, it was the Gulf Coast's turn. A tornado struck near Ponorasa in Lee County, destroying a houseboat and hurling a pontoon boat onto a dock. Minutes later, the same cell produced another EF-1 tornado that slammed into Mat Lache, ripping roofs from homes along the waterfront. But these were only precursors to what was about to unfold. At 12.09 p.m., the Fort Myers tornado was born. This large EF-2 monster tore across 16 and a half miles with winds topping 132 miles an hour, ripping through neighborhoods, country clubs, and manufactured home parks. Homes were damaged, warehouses were shredded, and entire communities left in shambles before it finally lifted near US-41. It would go down as one of the longest lived tornadoes of the entire outbreak. Almost simultaneously, fresh tornadoes erupted inland. At 12.37, a long track EF-1 plowed through Wild Island and Lorda in Highlands County, snapping trees and power poles, peeling roofs from ALF buildings and crossing US-98 as onlookers captured it on video. At 12.41, a water spout came ashore at El Jobin on the Mayaka River in Charlotte County, its EF-1 winds damaging homes before dissipating. By early afternoon, Highlands County had become the epicenter of destruction. Between 1.10 and 2.49 p.m., no fewer than seven tornadoes touched down. At 1.10 p.m., a brief EF-0 rattled Prairie Creek Preserve. Then at 2.13, a destructive EF-2 descended on Lake Placid, devastating the Tropical Harbor mobile home community. 30 homes were damaged or destroyed, a woman was injured when a wall collapsed, and one home was completely torn from its foundation. At 2.30 p.m., another EF-1 would slam into Venus, hurling boats, trailers, and vehicles into homes. One speedboat was launched directly into a residence, while an RV was discovered 100 yards from where it had stood minutes before. Shortly thereafter, yet another EF-1 would shred half the roof off the Archbald co-op station. Then, at 2.47 p.m., an EF-0 would strike Avon Park, damaging the Oak Tree Inn and rattling mobile homes before lifting over State Road 64. The final tornado in this burst touched down around 2.49 near Berea, snapping trees and tearing through rural land before finally dissipating. As the inland chaos intensified, however, so did the violence back to the east. 
At 2.24 p.m., another violent tornado would touch down in Glades County near Lakeport. This EF3 grew into a massive wedge tornado, with its winds screaming at around 140 miles per hour. It obliterated homes in the Sarasota Colony subdivision, flipped cars, and wrapped debris around trees. This tornado obliterated homes in the Sarasota Colony subdivision, flipping cars, wrapping debris around trees, and hurling a mobile home across a retention pond. 54 structures were damaged overall, and three people were injured. But the outbreak was far from finished. Even as Lakeport reeled from its devastation, the atmosphere to the east was brewing something even more punishing. South of Wellington, a tornado of rare and terrifying ferocity took shape, carving a path nearly 500 yards wide as it charged through the suburbs of Palm Beach County with unrelenting force. It was around this time during the day that my phone rang. On the other end was a close friend, her voice trembling. She was at a friend's house in Wellington and wanted to know where the tornado was heading. Pulling up radar scope, I felt my stomach drop. They were directly in the storm's path. I gave quick, urgent instructions on how to shelter and stayed on the phone as the storm bore down. Seconds stretched like hours. The tornado was so close that they could hear the roar from the outside. But by some miracle, the tornado veered just two or three blocks to their northwest. For them, the danger had passed. Others, however, would not be so fortunate. In Loxahatchee Groves and the acreage, entire strands of trees were ripped apart. Vehicles were tossed like toys and roofs were peeled from homes as if they were made of paper. Then came Avenir, where a brand new Publix saw its roof collapse in on itself. EF3 level winds hurled bars more than 100 yards and shattered impact resistant windows as though they were nothing. Jupiter Farms endured its own wave of destruction before the twister finally roared into Martin County. When it was over, 12 homes would lay in ruin, more than 50 suffered major damage, and seven people were injured. As the sun set in Milton's eye wall near the coastline of Sarasota County, Florida's landscape lay shredded and raw. In all, 46 tornadoes were confirmed across the peninsula on October 9th, including two EF3s, two EF2s, and a constellation of EF1s and zeros. Damage was reported in over 15 counties, from Lee and Charlotte to Palm Beach and Highlands. Tribal lands, urban neighborhoods, and rural communities alike were struck. So what actually made Milton's tornado outbreak truly stand out from the rest? Tornadoes are often a byproduct of landfalling tropical cyclones, yes, but what unfolded during Hurricane Milton was far from typical. As the storm's outer bands swept across the Florida Peninsula on October 8th and 9th, the atmosphere seemed almost engineered for tornadic development. The front right quadrant of Milton, already the most tornado-prone sector of any tropical cyclone, became the epicenter of this rare convergence. Here, strong low to mid-level wind flow, tropical dew points climbing into the mid-70s Fahrenheit, and well-timed daytime heating created a volatile environment. Each element alone was common in hurricanes, but together, they formed an exceptionally unstable mix, primed for something extraordinary. How often do we actually see these favorable ingredients line up in a single tropical system? Vertical wind shear, an essential ingredient for tornado formation, was unusually strong, encouraging rotating updrafts to flourish. Meanwhile, an unrelenting stream of warm, moist air from the tropics added that surface level instability, and storm relative helicity surged to remarkable values, feeding the spin into the atmosphere. Even the usual lid on storm development, known as convective inhibition, or a cap, was virtually non-existent. Air could just rise with ease, condensing into powerful, rotating thunderstorms. Embedded in Milton's rain bands, many of these thunderstorms evolved into supercells, an unusual trait for tropical cyclones. Doppler radar had revealed clear, persistent rotation in several of them. Tropical cyclone tornadoes also differ in another critical way from their plane's counterparts. Cloaked by thick rain bands, they're often invisible until it's too late. Their shrouded nature, combining with rapid formation means that warning times can be dangerously short. During Milton, the parameters, intense wind shear, extreme helicity, abundant surface moisture, and robust instability were among the most conducive ever observed for a tornado formation in a landfalling hurricane, surely the most since Ivan.
This makes Hurricane Milton's tornado outbreak a benchmark event. Though its direct death toll of six was tragically significant, it paled in comparison to the catastrophic outbreaks Florida has actually seen in the past, such as the Central Florida tornado outbreak of 1998, where 42 lives were lost, or the Groundhog Day outbreak of 2007, where we lost 21. Why the difference? Advances in early warning systems and public preparedness likely played a role, as did the fact that Milton's most violent tornadoes missed the state's most densely populated areas. Yet the sheer number of tornadoes and the rarity of the atmospheric setup that spawned them cements Milton as a meteorological milestone. It forced researchers to reevaluate just how dynamic and dangerous the tornado threat from hurricanes can be. Could future storms bring similar conditions? Are we fully prepared to recognize them before it's too late? Who's to say? Hurricane Milton's legacy isn't just written in the record books. It's also embedded in the questions it leaves behind, and in the science that continues probing into the complex, often invisible mechanisms that can turn a hurricane's outer bands into a breeding ground for violent tornadoes. In the wake of Hurricane Milton's devastating tornado outbreak, the human tool quickly came into focus. Six lives were lost directly, most of them in Spanish Lakes, a retirement community near Fort Pierce, reduced to rubble by a violent EF3. Dozens more were injured, and at least 25 people had to be rescued from the mangled remnants of homes and neighborhoods. The tornado outbreak alone caused $514 million in damage, while Milton's total losses approached a staggering $34 billion, nearly all of it in Florida. Meteorologically, though, Hurricane Milton was a once-in-a-generation event. With 46 confirmed tornadoes and astonishing 45 of them in a single day, it became the most prolific single-day tornado outbreak in Florida history. The National Weather Service issued 126 tornado warnings on October 9th alone, the second highest total ever for any U.S. state. Perhaps most remarkable, the storm spawned three EF3 tornadoes, something only two other tropical cyclones in Florida's history had ever achieved and not seen since Hurricane Agnes in 1972. Recovery efforts were able to move quickly. FEMA distributed nearly $1 billion directly to survivors and another $1.18 billion to state and local governments. Hundreds of search and rescue teams were deployed and a 10,000 person base camp was set up in St. Pete and disaster recovery centers opened across the state. Nonprofits from the Red Cross and Salvation Army to Samaritan's Purse and Hope Florida mobilized rapidly to provide shelter, food, and emotional support for those who had lost everything. But Hurricane Milton left behind more than just destruction. It left lessons. Florida lawmakers moved swiftly, introducing House Bill 1535 to close the gaps the storm had exposed. The bill aimed to streamline rebuilding permits, coordinating debris removal, bolster shelter capacity, including for people with disabilities and pets, and improve crane safety standards after one collapsed in St. Pete. The storm also reaffirmed the importance of Florida's modern building codes, with homes built to its current standards faring dramatically better than older structures. Still, Milton's unprecedented tornado activity revealed broader challenges that extend beyond Florida's borders. The difficulty forecasters faced in predicting its rapid intensification underscores the urgent need to refine numerical weather models and better understand the complex interplay between tropical and extratropical systems that can drive a storm's explosive growth. The cumulative burden of successive storms like Debbie and Helene and Milton and the immense strain on resources all point to the need for a more holistic approach to disaster preparedness. True resilience, we say, is about more than strong building codes. It requires sustained investment in infrastructure, seamless coordination amongst federal, state, local, and nonprofits, and a commitment to policies that evolve with every new lesson nature delivers. Milton's legacy will help shape Florida's future. From enhanced building codes and streamlined permitting to incentives for resilient rebuilding, the state has already begun hardening its communities. But the scale of the damage and the long road to recovery make one thing clear. Resilience is not a finish line. It's a continuous journey, one that must adapt and strengthen with each passing storm, because hurricanes like Milton can and will come again. Hey everybody, I hope you really liked this video. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and make sure to like and subscribe, ring that bell so you don't miss more content like it in the future. Thanks again, CJ with Florida Man Weller.